Greetings, this is Pastor Dan, and today's lesson is going to be on the Abrahamic Covenant. We've been studying uh, things that relate to eschatology, and this was for our, our midweek uh, Bible lesson, and so we're picking right up here with the Abrahamic Covenant, and I've included in my display, you can't see this, but I've included in my display a timer, so I know exactly how long I've I've taken, and I'm going to try to keep this to a 30-minute lesson. So we're going to get through as much of this as we can, and then whatever's left over, I'll uh, put that for next week. But today's lesson is going to be on the Abrahamic Covenant. And before we go too far, I would like to review some of the things that we have learned. In the uh, previous lessons, we've considered the meaning of eschatology. It is the study of last things. It's the study of end times. Uh, in a certain respect, it is the study of unfulfilled prophecy in the Bible. And so we're interested in these things. We want to study them. We also saw the importance of eschatology. It provides understanding and motivation to live for the Lord today. Eschatology is important for how we live as Christians today. Your eschatology has a direct connection to what we think about how we ought to live today. The third thing we saw was the importance of the issue of hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is a fancy word for Bible study, and it's talking about the method we use for interpreting the Bible in general and prophecy in particular. This particular point was brought out, uh, its importance was brought out to me very recently as I heard a sermon on Ezekiel chapter 39. And most of us probably are not all that familiar with Ezekiel chapter 39, but uh, the preacher was pointing out that one of the problems with this passage is that many have tried to interpret it literally and contemporaneously. And he saw this as a problem. This is a passage that speaks of Gog and Magog, and he's talking about how people have tried to interpret that literally and tried to uh, show that Gog and Magog were contemporary uh, people and nations um, during their day, the interpreter's day. And he disagreed with that, and because of that, he believed that Ezekiel intended this passage as being symbolic of God's victory over sin and evil. And so all, right there we see that he shifted from a literal hermeneutic. He said that's no good, and now he's going to move on with an allegorical hermeneutic or a spiritualizing of the text. And one of the reasons that he gave for being able to do that is because the number seven appears in this passage. It appears several times. Uh, three times, I think, altogether, if I remember correctly. And he said that the number seven is a symbolic number for perfection and completion. And that this indicates that this passage should be taken symbolically. Um, and I think that the, the man who is uh, preaching this sermon and those who are like him, ignore the fact that this passage is filled with real, literal people, places, events, and times. And so while the number seven may indeed be uh, used symbolically in this passage, it's connected to years and months. And if you're going to interpret this passage allegorically or symbolically, um, should the words years and months also be taken symbolically? And if so, where does all that end? The real issue in this passage, that's Ezekiel 39, is that if you take it literally, it indicates that God still has a plan for, for national and ethnic Israel. And this is something that most Christians today are not willing to consider. They don't want to consider the fact that God still has a plan for Israel. Well, that was a little bit of a rapid trail, but I just wanted to give an illustration of why the issue of hermeneutics matters and why we must interpret the Bible literally, normally, according to the intention of the biblical writer. Uh, the fourth point of review here is that we introduce the meaning and background 
of the covenants, of the covenants that we find in the Bible. Well, our objectives for today's lesson are these. So by the time we get to the end of the lesson, you're going to know the key passages related to the Abrahamic covenant, excuse me, the provisions of this covenant, that the nature of this covenant is unconditional, no conditions, that the, that the, that the duration of this covenant is eternal, that the fulfillment of this covenant is still future. It's still future from our perspective today, even. And finally, the relations of this covenant to other eschatological covenants. So how does the Abrahamic covenant relate to uh, the other covenants we'll be looking at? So let's start looking at uh, the Abrahamic covenant in particular. First thing we need to know is the key passages for the Abrahamic covenant. Now, let me just... Um, uh, preface this section by saying there's going to be a lot of scripture verses on the screen. So there's going to be a lot of words on the screen. But if you have your Bible, you can look these up in your Bible yourself. But I have included the scripture on the on the slides as they come up. The first passage we want to know, and, and the most important passage when we discuss the Abrahamic covenant, is Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And you'll notice the highlights. I've highlighted uh, the word your there in green, your and you. This is referring to Abram. And uh, in red are the references to what the Lord will do. So it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I, that is the Lord, will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so this is the Lord making promises to Abraham. And notice there's nothing in here that suggests that uh, Abram has to do anything. This passage is packed full of things that the Lord is going to do for Abram. The next uh, reference that we need to consider is Genesis chapter 13, verses 14 through 17. And the Lord, as Yahweh, said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, this is what the Lord says now, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants could also be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Again, here we see as a part of the um, Abrahamic covenant that uh, the Lord is going to do something for Abram, particularly as focused on the land promises here. And uh, this land is given to Abram and his descendants. And we also include, see included in here the fact that um, Abraham will be a, a mighty nation, or he'll have a lot of people, a lot of descendants. And uh, if people could number the dust of the earth, then they could actually number his descendants. But since that's impossible, they won't be able to number his descendants. Let's go to our third passage. It's found in Genesis chapter 15, 1 through 21. This is quite extended, and uh, this passage is going to run on to uh, several slides. And uh, in this passage, we're going to see an explanation of who the descendants of promise are. Okay, because we know that Abram had more than one option for a descendant, and we're going to find out who's the descendant of promise. Verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. 
But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, no one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir. And he's referring to Eleazar. But one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Now look toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, as the Lord said to Abram, So shall your descendants be. And he, Abram, believed in the Lord. And he, the Lord, accounted it to him for righteousness. Notice the emphasis on faith there. He believed. Abram believed the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 7, Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. So now we, we shift a little bit from who the descendant will be. It will be someone from the uh, body of Abraham. It will be a natural descendant, a biological descendant. Now he switches to uh, the land. Verse 8, And he said to him, that's Abram said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Now, we learned last week that in this passage, it's going to be talking about the suzerain vassal treaty. And that's what's in, in view here. So there's going to be a ceremony about making a covenant here. And in this ceremony, you have these animals. Verse 10. Then he, that's Abram, brought all these to him, to the Lord, and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abraham, the Lord said to Abraham, Abram's asleep, but the Lord speaks to him. He says this, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. And also the nations whom they serve, nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now, Abraham, or Abram in this case, in verse 8, he questions the Lord. How's he going to know this? And some think that because he did that and he just didn't accept it uh, by faith, that uh, his descendants are going to, Abram's descendants are now going to be strangers in the land. In other words, they're not going to be able to enjoy the promised land right away. They're going to have to wait 400 years. Verse 15, now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass, when the sun went down, it was dark, and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. Last week we talked about how the, the smoking oven and uh, burning torch represented the Lord. Verse 18, On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your descendants I have given this land. Now we have the boundaries of the land given. From the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. The Kenites, Kenizrezites, the uh, Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Pezerites, the Rephim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, Girgashites, and the Jebusites. And so, Again, we see the reinforcement of the covenant that God made with Abram in Genesis chapter 12. Here particularly, it's going to talk about, uh, it talked about his descendant. It wouldn't be Eleazar, but it would come from his own body. And it's talking about the part of the covenant that covers the land, that this land that God gives to Abram will be given to his descendants. 
and it talks about the ceremony that took place um, as a sign of the covenant or, or as a, a symbol that the covenant has been made. The next passage to consider is Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 27. Again, this is the entire chapter, and so it will also be several slides. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make a covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you the father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your descendants after you in their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Verse 8. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are strangers, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So in the first seven verses, we have this blessing from God promised, and now we have the land promise. Verse 9, And God said to Abram, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generations, he who is born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant, He who is born in your house and he who is bought with the money must be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Verse 15. Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be your name. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she shall be the, the mother of nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Then Abram fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Then God said, No, Sarah your wife shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant. So if you remember just a passage or so ago, Abraham's heir was Eleazar of Damascus, and God said he's not the guy of promise. He's not the heir of promise. The heir of promise is going to come from your body. And now in the intervening time, Abraham has had a son with Hagar, uh, Sarah's handmaiden. And now God says, the name of that child was Ishmael. And he says, Ishmael is not the the, uh, son of promise. The son of promise is going to come from Sarah, your wife. And, And this is the one, the son of promise, who will... Um, have this covenant, who, who will be the one who receives the covenant after uh, Abraham is dead. Verse 20, And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. Of course, we know that Ishmael is the foundation or founder of the Arab people. Verse 21, but my covenant I will establish with Isaac. Again, the emphasis on the covenant being with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. Then he finished talking with him, and God went up from Abram. So Abram took Ishmael's son, all who were born in his house, and all who were 
uh, bought with his money, every male among the men of Abram's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin that very same day as God had said to him. Abram was, Abraham was 99 years old when he circum, was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very same day, Abraham was circumcised in his son Ishmael. And all the men of his house, born in the house, or bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. So even though Abram laughed at this promise from God, um, he did go on to obey God and uh, circumcised all the men in his house. Let's look at another verse. This is the last verse here. Uh, Genesis chapter, or passage, Genesis chapter 22 Verses 15 through 18. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. So this is talking about when Abraham is going to offer Isaac according to the Lord's command. Verse 17. Blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies, and your seed, all the nations of the earth, shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now notice here, especially in verse 17, that this is an increase of the blessing. He says, I will bless you and multiply multiplying, I will multiply you. So, blessing, I will bless you. Multiplying, I will multiply you. So, that's, that's an increase. That's an emphasis there. And notice in verse 18, we pick up on the universal uh, provision in the um, Abrahamic covenant found in Genesis 12, verse 3. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And so, these are the key passages. So anytime we speak of the Abrahamic covenant, uh, these six passages should always be in our mind. Most importantly should be Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. So anytime we speak of the Abrahamic covenant, you should remember Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. If you can only remember one passage, this is the passage to remember. But also remember these other passages um, if you can. So it's pretty straightforward. 12, 13, skip, 15 skip 16, 17, 18, and then jump to 22. So if you can kind of think it like that, maybe it will help you uh, to remember these chapters. Well, now let's quickly go through the uh, provisions of the Abrahamic covenant. There are three categories of provisions included in the Abrahamic covenant, and we're using Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, as the basis of, um, from which we get these provisions, because this is the passage that is the basis of all the other repetitions of the Abrahamic covenant that we have already looked at. So here's the three categories of provisions. There's personal blessings to Abram himself. There's national blessings to Israel or the descendants of Abraham. And there's universal blessings to all. So let's take a little bit closer look at uh, these uh, three categories of provision. There are four personal blessings found in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Number one, he, or Abra Abraham, will be made a great nation. So this is the first personal blessing. Abraham will be made a great nation. Many nations will come from him, not just one, but many nations will come from him. Number three, he would be prosperous. Abraham is going to be prosperous. That's to be blessed, is to be made prosperous. And finally, Canaan would be his land forever. Um, he is given the promise of Canaan. So that's, a, that's Abraham's personal land. The next category of provision is the national provisions, the national blessings. And we see five of those. First, a national, the national blessings, the national provisions would go through Isaac and Jacob. So it's going to follow on to Abraham, son of promise, Isaac, and then his son of blessing, Jacob. 
And so another part of the national blessing is there's going to be an actual national existence for the Jewish people, for the descendants of Abraham. They're going to be a great nation. They're going to have a lot of influence on the world. God is going to make them great. The fourth is, again, concerning the land area. And this land area is an everlasting covenant to the Jewish people. And number five, we see that this is a continuation of the covenant. There, it's going to be a perpetual covenant. And, and while these blessings might seem redundant with Abraham's personal blessings, they are not. Uh, they are showing the extension of the blessings that Abraham receives from God onto his descendants. So the, these national blessings are, in, in fact, extensions of those blessings. Now, the third and last category is the universal blessing. Um, one universal blessing. It's, it says in verse 3 of Genesis 12, all nations would receive a blessing through the physical descendants of Abraham. And uh, as we think about this blessing, there's really two aspects to this one bless blessing. The first aspect focuses on how the nations treat the prom uh, how the nations treat um, the nation of Israel, the Jews. So how do they treat them? If they if they bless uh, the nation of Israel, then they will be blessed. If they if they bless the the Jews as a people. These nations will receive a blessing from the Lord. But if they don't, then the Lord is going to curse them. If they curse the Jews, then God is going to curse them. The second aspect of this uh, universal blessing focuses on a blessing that everyone can have. And this is ultimately through the Messiah of the Jews. And if, if we just quickly look at verse 3 and... Uh, Genesis chapter 12, let me remind you uh, what it says. He says, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, one of the things that is happening here is that um, the, the Lord uses a different word for families and nations. Th those are not the same words. And so he's not talking about nations being blessed uh, in particularly at the end of verse 3, he's talking about the families of the earth, the different people groups of the earth, and even individuals of the earth are going to be blessed uh, in Abram, in Abraham. Well, we're just about up to uh, the 30-minute mark on our lesson, so I want to go ahead and, and stop us right there. And uh, just remember, these passages and provisions of the Abrahamic covenant. Um, the next time in our next lesson, we'll talk about the nature of the Abrahamic covenant, its duration and its fulfillment, and how it connects to uh, the other covenants that we'll be studying.